What if I told you that 400 years ago, a Dutch inventor defied gravity, plunged beneath the River Thames, and showed a king what no one else dared to dream, all with a rickety boat of wood and leather? Meet Cornelius Drebbel, the restless genius who launched the world's first navigable submarine in 1620. This isn't a tale spun from fantasy, it's history, raw and real, etched in the annals of human daring. Strap in, because we're diving into a story that reshapes everything you thought you knew about the limits of ingenuity. A journey that begins with a spark in a quiet Dutch town. In 1572, as the world turned quietly around the sleepy canals of Alkmaar, a boy was born into a modest life. Cornelius Jacobsoon Drebbel, son of a landowner with no hint of the riches that fame might promise. Beneath his plain exterior burned a restless mind. Picture him, a kid with tousled hair, crouched by a canal, watching boats skim the surface, wondering what if a vessel could slip beneath the waves and roam the hidden depths. His schooling was simple, Latin lessons in Alkmaar, but destiny called when he apprenticed with Hendrik Goltzius, a master engraver and alchemist in Harlem. Goltzius didn't just teach him to etch copper, he showed him how to transform the ordinary into the extraordinary. By his twenties, Cornelius had married Goltzius's sister, Sophia, and settled back in Alkmaar, sketching maps and tinkering with machines. In 1598, he patented a perpetual motion machine, a clock driven by air pressure and temperature shifts. It wasn't truly perpetual, science would later debunk that, but it stunned onlookers and put his name on the map. That name reached King James I of England, a monarch hungry for marvels, and in 1604, James summoned him to London. Cornelius packed his tools, his family, and his wild dreams, crossing the sea to a land where his canal-side musings would soon take root, setting the stage for a leap into the unknown. As Cornelius stepped into London in 1604, a city buzzing with explorers charting new worlds and scholars probing the stars welcomed him with open curiosity. King James I, a lover of science and spectacle, brought him to his court at Eltham Palace. The Dutchman didn't waste time. He unveiled his perpetual motion clock, a globe atop pillars, ticking away time, date and seasons without a crank. Courtiers gaped, James grinned. Then, in 1620, he chilled Westminster Abbey's Great Hall with a cooling machine, turning a sweltering July day into a frosty marvel. Lords shivered, ladies clutched their shawls, and the king bolted from the cold, half amazed, half alarmed. Cornelius wasn't just a showman, he was a dreamer with a bigger plan. Years by Dutch canals and Goltzius's alchemical lessons had planted an idea, a boat that could dive. English mathematician William Bourne had sketched a submersible in 1578. Wooden with leather bladders for buoyancy. But it was a paper dream. Cornelius saw beyond it. He wanted a vessel that moved, that carried people through the underwater unknown. James, ever the patron of bold ideas, handed him the resources to try. The River Thames became his proving ground, a bustling lifeline where merchants shouted, fishermen cast nets and a Dutchman with a gleam in his eye sketched plans no one else could fathom, ready to turn his vision into reality. By 1620, as the Thames flowed steadily through London's heart, a workshop near its banks hummed with purpose. Cornelius Drebbel's first submarine took shape, not a sleek metal beast, but a rowboat reborn. Its wooden frame was cloaked in greased leather to repel water. Six oars poked through, sealed with leather gaskets, under the seats, pigskin bladders tied to pipes controlled the dive, water in to sink, air out to rise. Two snorkel-like tubes, buoyed by floats, stretched to the surface for air. A rudder steered this fragile craft through the gloom. Breathing underwater was the riddle. Skeptics sneered, they'll choke. But Cornelius had a trick. Scientist Robert Boyle, writing decades later, claimed Drebbel heated saltpeter potassium nitrate in a retort, releasing a gas, likely oxygen, to sustain his crew. Oxygen wasn't named until 1774, but Cornelius, who'd turned sulfur into acid for emperors, could have stumbled onto it. The snorkels backed him up, pulling in Thames air when the chemical magic waned. Modern chemists nod. It's plausible. He didn't work alone. Sons-in-law Abraham and Johannes Kuffler hammered and stitched beside him, 
every seam a life or death bet. One leak, one tear, and the river would claim them. The first test was quiet. A few rowers, pulses racing, watched the bladders fill. The Thames closed over them, three feet, six, twelve. The hull groaned but held. When they broke the surface, grinning, Cornelius had done it. The world's first navigable submarine, born of wood, leather and sheer will, a triumph that would soon face its greatest stage. Sometime between 1620 and 1624, as the years blurred in history's haze, but witnesses like Sir William Brereton pinned it firmly in memory, the River Thames transformed into a stage for the impossible. Picture London in the early 17th century, a sprawling, smoky city of half-timbered houses, its riverbanks teeming with life. Barges hauled wool, fishermen wrestled nets, and children darted through the mud, oblivious to the marvel about to unfold. On this day, thousands gathered from Westminster to Greenwich, their eyes locked on a strange craft, bobbing in the current. Cornelius Drebbel's third submarine, his grandest yet. This wasn't the humble rowboat of his first test. This was a beast of ambition, six oars strong, its wooden frame stretched to hold sixteen souls, its leather skin taut and glistening under the pale English sun. King James I, clad in velvet and gold, stood on a royal barge flanked by courtiers, his sharp eyes glinting with curiosity. James wasn't just a king, he was a scholar king, author of Demonologia, a man who craved the edge of human possibility. Cornelius, now in his fifties, his hair streaked with grey, exuded a quiet confidence as he oversaw the preparations. This wasn't a mere experiment, it was a declaration to the world. The crowd buzzed with whispers. A boat that sinks on purpose, a merchant muttered, clutching his cap. Madness, a fishwife scoffed, yet she didn't look away. Cornelius ignored them, his focus on the craft. The rowers, twelve sturdy men, likely Thames watermen, hardened by years of oaring, took their places, gripping the oars that jutted through leather-sealed ports. Two crewmen manned the bladders, ready to flood them with river water. Cornelius, perhaps at the rudder, gave a sharp nod. The bladders swelled, the bow dipped, and then it was gone. The Thames rippled over the spot where it vanished, only the snorkel tubes bobbing above like the antennae of some strange sea beast. Beneath the waves, at 12 to 15 feet deep, the world shifted. The hull creaked under the pressure, the murky water pressing against the leather skin. Light filtered dimly through the surface, casting eerie shadows across the rowers' faces. The air was thick, a mix of Thames breeze from the snorkels and perhaps that faint chemical tang from Cornelius's saltpeter retort, a secret he guarded closely. For three hours they rowed, two miles downstream toward Greenwich, then back against the sluggish current. Imagine the silence, broken only by the rhythmic splash of oars and the occasional drip seeping through a seam. If James was aboard, and some like the Dutch envoy Constantine Huygens insist he was, picture him hunched in the gloom, his royal hands gripping the bench, marvelling at fish darting past, their scales glinting like coins in the murk. Historian Henry Hakewill counters, he stayed topside, too cautious for the plunge, but the king's presence, diving or not, blessed the moment with royal weight. When the submarine resurfaced, the crowd erupted. A 1621 pamphlet, the diurnal of Thomas Rugg, captured it. The people roared as if the dead had risen, the Dutchman's boat breaking the water like a whale. Men waved hats, women clutched their children, and James, whether soaked or dry, beamed with approval. Cornelius stepped ashore, his boots squelching, his face alight with triumph. This wasn't just a dive, it was a bridge to a future where humans could claim the deep. A moment of awe that London, battered by plague and war, would carry forward even as the glow began to fade. Yet as the cheers echoed along the Thames, the triumph proved fleeting for glory is a fickle flame. Cornelius had built three submarines between 1620 and 1624, each larger, each bolder. Yet the English Royal Navy turned a cold shoulder. Picture the scene. Cornelius, his coat threadbare from years of toil, standing before admirals in their gilded chambers at Whitehall. He gestured to sketches of his leather-clad craft, his voice hoarse with passion. It moves unseen, he urged, a weapon to strike from below. 
but the admirals, their minds tethered to sails and cannons, saw only a curiosity. A toy, one snorted, flicking ash from his pipe, no match for a galleon, another grumbled. The navy, stretched thin by wars with Spain and France, had no room for a Dutchman's dream. Funding dried up like a summer stream. Life grew grim. Sophia, his wife, had a taste for finery. Silks from Antwerp, silver from Prague, that outpaced their means. Once Cornelius had dazzled Emperor Rudolf II in 1610, crafting sulfuric acid in Prague's golden courts, only to be briefly jailed when war erupted. Now in London, he faced a quieter prison, debt. His family teetered on ruin, the Thames dive a fading echo. By 1629, he took a humbling turn, leasing an alehouse near the Strand. Picture him behind the bar, a man who'd once chilled Westminster Abbey, now pouring pints for dock workers and sailors. The clink of coins replaced the creak of oars, the chatter of drunks drowning out his once grand visions. Yet Cornelius didn't surrender. His hands, calloused from hammers and retorts, kept moving. He perfected a scarlet dye from tin and cochineal, a vivid red that swept European courts, thanks to his sons-in-law Abraham and Johannes Kuffler, who turned it into a thriving trade. He built microscopes that peeled back the unseen, lenses so sharp they revealed the dance of mites on a cheese rind. He crafted thermostats to tame heat, incubators to hatch eggs, each a testament to a mind that refused to rust. The submarines, though, sat abandoned by the Thames, their leather rotting, their wooden bones picked clean by time. Imagine the ache, a man who touched tomorrow, watching it slip through his fingers. His spirit drew others still. A young Robert Hooke, born the year Cornelius died, would later cite Drebbel's microscopes as inspiration for his own micrographia. Alchemists whispered of his saltpetre trick, passing it down like a sacred riddle. But in those alehouse years, Cornelius was a shadow of his former self. Proud, yes, but worn. A man who'd given the world a glimpse of the deep, only to see it shrugged off, yet whose legacy was quietly taking root. Even as Cornelius Drebbel breathed his last on November 7th, 1633, at 61, in a dim London tavern, his story didn't end there. For echoes of genius linger beyond the grave. His hair was grey, his hands scarred from decades of creation. His submarines were gone, lost to decay or scavengers, but their echo lingered like a tide that never fully recedes. The Kuffler brothers carried his name across Europe, hawking his microscopes and telescopes to scholars in Paris and Amsterdam. Thames' side tales of the underwater boat grew taller with each telling. By 1650, a bard in Southwark swore it had fought sea monsters, though the truth was marvel enough. For centuries, his feet faded into shadow. The world wasn't ready. Then, in 1776, during the American Revolution, David Bushnell's turtle, a one-man submersible with a hand-cranked propeller, attacked British ships in New York Harbor. It failed to sink its target, but proved a point. Submarines could strike unseen. In 1800, Robert Fulton's Nautilus, a copper-clad beauty, dived under the Seine, dazzling Napoleon with its potential. By 1870, Jules Verne spun his fictional Nautilus in 20,000 leagues under the sea, a dream of steel and steam that owed its soul to Cornelius's leather and wood. Each was a ripple from that Thames dive, a testament to a seed planted 400 years before. The proof came alive in 2002, when the BBC's Building the Impossible resurrected Cornelius's third submarine. Craftsmen used 17th century tools, adzes, awls, and hand-stitched leather to recreate it, down to the pigskin bladders and snorkel tubes. On a lake near Windsor Castle, it plunged 12 feet deep, rowers powering it for three hours, just as it had on the Thames. Naval historian Dr. Richard Compton Hall, who oversaw the test, marveled, Drebbel's design was crude, but brilliant. He solved submersion and navigation centuries before steam or steel. That replica now rests near Richmond Bridge, a quiet monument to a man who saw beyond his time. His saltpetre trick, chemists like Dr. Andrea Seller of University College London have tested it. Heating potassium nitrate does release oxygen, enough to sustain a small crew in a cramped hull. It wasn't perfect, and the snorkels were vital, but it bridged alchemy to science. Today, submarines rule the seas, 
nuclear behemoths like the USS Nautilus, 1954, research vessels plumbing the Mariana Trench, even tourist subs off Hawaii, all trace their lineage to Cornelius's fragile craft. In 1960, the Netherlands honored him with a postage stamp. A lunar crater bears his name. The boy from Alkmaar had left a mark the world couldn't erase, a legacy that invites us to look deeper still. And so, as we step back from the Thames and the Tavern, let's see Cornelius Drebbel not as a footnote, but as a man pulsing with wonder. Picture him by that childhood canal in Alkmaar, a boy tracing ripples with a stick, dreaming of what lay beneath. See him in Prague, dazzling Rudolf II with acid and optics, his mind a furnace of ideas even as war caged him. Watch him in his Thames-side workshop, grease-streaked and sleepless, stitching leather under flickering lamplight, the weight of skepticism pressing as hard as the river itself. Feel the chill as he rode beneath the waves, King James at his side, the murky deep a silent embrace. This wasn't just a submarine, it was a rebellion against limits, a question. What if, answered with sweat and wood? His life was no fairy tale, doubt dogged him, Courtiers mocked his toys, admirals spurned his vision. Poverty gnawed at him, Sophia's extravagance left them teetering, yet he never stopped. His microscopes unveiled worlds too small for the naked eye, fleas like armoured knights, pollen like starry orbs, inspiring Robert Hooke's 1665 masterpiece, Micrographia. His scarlet dye clothed kings, his thermostats tamed fire. Naval architect William Hovgaard wrote in 1920, Drebbel's submarine, though primitive, proved submersion and navigation were possible. Ideas that birthed modern fleets. Bushnell, Fulton, even the nuclear subs of the Cold War, all walked a path he'd hacked through the unknown. Cornelius was a bridge. He stood between alchemy's mysticism, turning saltpeter into breath, and science's rigor, testing ideas with his hands. He didn't win wars or fill coffers in his lifetime, but he planted a seed. 300 years later, submarines would rule the seas, tools of war, discovery and wonder, because one man dared to dive. Imagine him in that alehouse, sketching on a scrap of paper as drunks brawled, his mind still churning. He died poor but rich in what mattered, a legacy of possibility. Why does this matter to us? Because Cornelius is every dreamer who's been laughed off the stage. We've all had wild ideas, sketches in notebooks, whispers in the dark, dismissed as folly. He says, chase them anyway, build them, test them, dive into the deep, even if the world isn't ready. His story isn't just history. It's a spark for anyone who's ever stared at the horizon and wondered what lies beyond. A call to the restless, the curious, the brave that resonates with us still. There's Cornelius Drebbel's saga, 400 years old, yet fresh as the Thames tide. Mind blown. Hit like, share this with your crew, and subscribe to Obscure Minds for more forgotten brilliance. Drop your thoughts below. What's your what if? Let's keep unearthing the wild and wondrous together.